So welcome. Hi, everybody. We ready to go? We're ready. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to, my goodness, the Reinvention Virtual Chat and the Power of Reinvention podcast. This is one of my wonderful hybrid events that enables me to have our community from the Reinvention Virtual Chat join us at the same time that we are recording our podcast with my incredible guest today, Larry Roberts. So if any of you have been thinking about what it's like to do a podcast, you're about to find out some behind the scenes, nitty gritty, dirty little secrets, the trials and tribulations that I have personally been through with my amazing friend, Larry, who really took me through the process and kind of made it feel like it was just a wild ride at an amusement park. <laughs> so hopefully you too will get over any fear that you have. And I just am really excited to have everybody here today. Um, I'm going to start with a little reading from my book, as I always love to do, because when I launched my book in March of last year, I was not able to go on book tour because we all were sent scurrying home to work and play from home for the last year and a half. And we are now just re-emerging in lots of new and wonderful ways. But at the time, I decided that instead of going on book tour, which wasn't an option, I would bring the book tour to the people through the Reinvention Virtual Chat, launched my podcast in January of this year. So I always love to share a little reading for my book, which is exactly what I would have been doing had I been in bookstores and speaking events and what have you all year long. So I'm going to read from chapter six today. The topic is the courage to reinvent and fight the fear. A small dose of courage helps with reinvention. Do you have it? Where does one find the courage to make a change? Change requires a great leap of faith to define and explore your wants and needs. When you understand that you need a change or have merely entertained the thought, the first reaction is usually fear, fear of the unknown. Reality of some sort sets in and you quickly negate the notion the change is in the cards. You play the same mantra over and over in your head. You come up with the same excuses and you rationalize all the reasons why you can't pursue that dream, your passion, that relationship, career, or goal. Maybe old stories and habits are running you and you've not managed to rewire your connection to change, but what is really stopping you? A great quote from Maya Angelou. Courage is the most important of all the virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. You can practice any virtue erratically, but nothing consistently without courage. I'm going to leave it right there because I feel like anybody that is taking on an endeavor we have a desire in this case, so many are joining today to listen to that desire to launch a podcast. That's a pretty major endeavor. It sounds like a really fun, lofty idea, but my goodness, the courage to do something different, the courage to learn so many new things, the courage to get out of your comfort zone and try on something that you've never done before, to reach out to someone for help, to say, I don't know how to do that help me. There's courage, there is fear, but it is so exciting when we get over those hurdles. And I just thought with the story and journey that Larry's been on in his life and what he's doing today and who he has become in this world of podcasting, let alone everything else, there's a lot of courage at play here. So welcome, Larry. Thank you for being here. So excited for you to be a guest on my show. I can't believe I'm here. So thank you very, very much for having me, Kathy. You know, it, it seems like I've been working with you a lot longer than just January. It, it, it seems like I've known you for years, honestly. And I know. It's, it's just the relationship is tremendous and we wouldn't have it if, well, for a couple of things, you mentioned the fact that you would have been on a book tour. Uh, I never would have had the opportunity to meet you if you didn't have to take your book tour virtually. So, you know, all these things, they came together and here we are today. And again, I can't thank you enough for having me here. I love that. So true. I know such blessings for the people that I have met, the virtual rooms that I've been in, the people that I've connected with in the last 18, 19 months has been extraordinary. 
So let's take a moment. I'm just going to share with you a little background on Larry so you have some context, and then we're going to do a deeper dive into this conversation. Larry is a high energy and charismatic podcaster, speaker, best selling author, and international top rated course creator with over 1,200 students in 51 countries. Larry's been in coaching and facilitator roles for more than 25 years. He's quickly becoming one of the most sought after podcast consultants and content creators in the industry. He was featured in Podcast Magazine, and he is the editor-in-chief of one of the largest industry newsletters, the PodFest Messenger, and regularly participates in industry panels, appears on other podcasts, as well as speaking at special events. He specializes in all things podcast. While consistently publishing quality content of his own, he's also available for coaching, podcast auditing, and digital course creation. You can also find his podcast, You're the Boss, on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and countless other podcast providers, with new episodes being made available on Tuesdays of every week. And if you don't already know about You're the Boss, then I highly recommend that you tune in. And uh, gosh... Gosh, Larry, where do we begin? You covered it all. So thanks for having me. It's been okay, awesome. great. Fabulous. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs> First of all, let's talk about this voice. I mean, Larry has this voice for radio and podcasting like none other. Every time I hear him and talk to him, whether it's over the phone, whether it's on a show, we had the pleasure of being on PodMax together. He interviewed me. I've interviewed Larry in the past, which just, you know, we have this incredible dynamic and energy between us and just so much respect for what you're doing. But I want to take you back in time before we get into the here and now. Sure. Did you imagine that this was your life calling? Did you envision, you know, who was little Larry, as I like to ask, you know, who was little Larry that, you know, I could just see him. Can you see him with the little red hat running around, just <laughs> creating mischief? Cause I can but I'm gonna have you to know, send you a picture, Kathy, of me okay. and little Larry with a similar hat. I was probably okay. about three. There, the picture exists, and I'm going to send it to you. Oh, I can't wait! I'm going to add it to the website. That's the picture that we'll use when we post it on the podcast on the <laughs> on the Reinvention Exchange. Um, but really, you know, you you've had so many different parts of your life and and adventures and ventures that you've been a part of. Let's talk about sort of what you dreamed of when you were younger. What did you picture? Where did you come from? Where you know? How did you end up where you are today? Yeah, it's it, man. It, you know, I'm 49 years old, so the story it, it it has a lot of different turns and twists. But I was born in a little bitty town in North Texas called Denison, Texas. Uh, one of our former presidents, Dwight David Eisenhower, was born there as well. And uh, his actual house where he was born was, I think it's like three blocks from my grandma's house. So I would pass it uh, all the time because I basically lived over at grandma's as often as I possibly could. Um, and, and did I see this as my path? No, not really. Um, when I was in high school, I mean, if you look at my class ring, I wasn't exactly the athlete. I did play basketball, but I, I didn't play it very well. As a matter of fact, there was one game in particular where the coach literally yelled from the sidelines of a home game in front of family and friends, Larry, don't shoot the ball. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that says a lot right there, my friend. Yeah, so I'm bragging right now. But uh, so my class ring actually had art and business um, uh, icons on the side of my senior ring. So talk about Nerdville. Uh, but my idea was to go to New York and work on the stock exchange. I wanted to be a stockbroker. That's just what okay. I knew I was going to do uh, when I was in high school. But, um, well, some extracurricular activities brought another little life form into this world and plans changed dramatically. So came right out of high school and went into selling cars of all things. But okay. uh, I did well selling cars and I moved into a trainer role. So that's where training really started. I started training people there. Uh, simultaneously, I was also thinking that at this stage, and I'm in my mid twenties, early to mid twenties, thinking I'm going to be a world championship kickboxer. Cause I finally found an athletic endeavor that I could do well. And, uh, I was a kickboxer and early, early mixed martial arts adopter back in the early nineties. Uh, and so I was teaching karate and I was teaching kickboxing and teaching in that role and teaching salespeople. So facilitation just kind of came natural to me. 
Uh, but business, for whatever reason, did not. So when I left the car business and started a karate school, it failed miserably. I made like $2,000 that year when I started my karate school. And my wife at the time goes, look, bro, I, I know you want to be a world title fighter and this and that, but we need to eat. So, so I had to get a real job. And that's exactly what I did at a company called Texas Instruments. And I came on there as a corporate trainer hung out there for three years and then felt it was time to get out of the little town of Sherman Denison and go to the big city and live in Dallas. That's, that's and, kind of an exciting move. Was that a moment of, you know, trepidation and fear or was it an adventure? Like what was your sentiment about change? Because yeah. so many people perceive change as very fearful and very distressful. And for others, it's like, Oh, this is an adventure. I'm so excited. Where were you on the spectrum of that? A little of both because I was excited about the the career advancement because that's what was happening was going down to Dallas. I landed a job at a at a company down in Dallas and I just knew this was I was going to have my loft apartment that I had visualized being a, a stockbroker when I was in high school. You know, that's the I think Wall Street was out about that same time with, with right. machines. So, of course, I wanted that loft apartment and that lifestyle. Oh, yeah. This was my ticket. I was going to go do this and it was going to be awesome. 21 years later, which was at the top of this year, I finally quit that job <laughs> and I never got my loft apartment, but it was, it was definitely an adventure. It was, it was great getting out of the big city. Uh, it was a big transition at the time too, because I was still trying to chase that, that, that professional fighter dream uh, that materialized to a certain degree. But I, I, I eventually had the realization that due to some physical birth defects that I had, uh, I wasn't going to be able to compete on the world stage like I had dreamed of. I just couldn't, right. no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't compete with these guys just physically. Yeah. And so that was more of a shock than anything, but that kind of changed gears and career became the focus. And that's, that's where I ran with it. Uh, this whole time I'm in a facilitator type role. And even back in the early 2000s, maybe late 90s, I took voice acting for the very first time. Because I thought, you know what, I keep hearing that I have this voice. People keep telling me I have this voice. So maybe voice acting is where I'm going to make my impact. And at the time, the industry was a lot different than it is today. Back then, to land a voice gig, you really had to wait. And this sounds so morbid, but this is exactly what the instructor told me. In order to land one of the bigger gigs as a cartoon voiceover artist or somebody really in the industry, you literally have to wait for somebody to die. My goodness. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> That's what they told me because the industry was so small. And uh, they had, a, I mean, it was a very niche industry and they had their top performers. And that was very discouraging. So I faded out of that limelight for a long time. And uh, you, you know, but eight years ago, uh, I actually ended up in rehab because yeah. during this time I lost complete focus. I didn't have fighting. I didn't really, my career was boring. You know, I'm just doing the same thing over and over. I've been with the same company for, well, eight years ago. It was, I don't know, mid teens, 15 years, we'll say we'll round it out. Uh, and it, I was just lost and drinking became my escape but it overtook me. And yep. uh, I remember the day that it happened, I was sitting on the couch after I'd already been in the hospital once in 2013 for alcohol poisoning. And it was November 13th of 13. And uh, I had a moment of clarity. I mean, I'd been on the couch for a couple of weeks now out of work. They didn't fire me. They supported me actually and did everything they could to help me. Amazing. Uh, but a voice came and said, Hey man, uh, either you get help today or tomorrow's not happening. And it's hard to, hard to really convey what that taking place because it was so clear and it there's no reason that I should have heard this voice or had this clarity or whatever the moment was but I reached out I got help and I got clean and I've been clean now for eight years so I haven't had a sip of alcohol since I, since I got out so that's cool and all but yeah. I got out of there and I was lost so I'm like okay well I don't have an escape I'm not drinking anymore and well the job I'm glad I still have it or career whatever you want to call it Right. But I just didn't have anything. And somebody told me I needed to listen to the Joe Rogan podcast because I'm a big fight fan and he calls the ultimate fighting championship. And they just knew that I would love this thing called a podcast. And I'm like, bro, I don't have time for this. This is stupid. I don't listen to this stuff. And I eventually broke down and heard uh, an episode and the episode of the podcast had two comedians on there. And now these aren't just comedians. These are comedians that kind of embodied the eighties comedians of the time. If you think back to the Sam Kinnison's and the Dice Clay's and the, right. and the Robin Williams and those guys that I shouldn't have, but did grow up on. 
Uh, and I was blown away at what I heard. I was like, oh my gosh, you can do this on a podcast. This is awesome. Wow. And then I just jumped right back in head first and we launched, I, I, I partnered with a, a friend of mine and we launched a comedy podcast. Now that podcast was a little blue and by blue, I mean, you know, it was some adult content and some, okay, some questions. I was like blue, blue, Yeah, no, it just, <laughs> trying to define what that meant in that yeah, context. Thank you. That's an industry term for yes. dirty comedy. Oh, fun. So, yeah. And, and so we, we had the podcast doing extremely well. I mean, we were crushing the downloads. We took the show downtown Dallas to a live radio station down there. We, we did the show live on air for several months, crushed the ratings there, took the show live to a stage show, did extremely well there. And we ended up taking the stage show. And to this day, the club where we started the show it's still the largest open mic in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex outside of a comedy club. So oh, even as I speak right now, every Monday night, that club's rocking with the open mic that we started with our show. That so, is brilliant. It was amazing. And I got to top it here. My buddy, my, my co-host, he now, he just recently, it's been a couple of months now, signed his first residency at the new Sahara in Las Vegas, opening for Eddie Griffin. So he Who is that? From, what's his name? His name is stage name is Jamie Gravy. Okay. And he is the opener for Eddie Griffin now at the Sahara three nights a week. And uh, it all started with that podcast. It's unbelievable, but that's where it took him. And I'm so, so proud of him. That's amazing. And look at what it launched for you. I mean, that's, that's the beauty, the anomalies of sometimes just stopping long enough to focus and dig into a passion that you didn't even realize you'd ever have, right? It's not like, and that's why I asked, like when you were young, did you sort of envision that you would want to be this counselor, this trainer, this visionary that had, you know, all you, you just never know where life is going to take you. And you just have to be open to the possibilities of what's going to show up and where that may lead you to. And clearly that's the crossroads that you were at and you really leaned into it. And from there, you know, continue, please. Oh, well, from there, you know, I still had my career position and it was a fairly high ranking position within this company and the company has been growing. I mean, it's been in business for well over a hundred years It's an automotive industry company. And through some acquisitions, we had brought on some new management, which led to me having a brand new direct report, meaning I directly reported to this new individual. And he caught wind of the podcast and was not a fan, did not like the content, did not like the language, did not like anything about it for that matter. And although he didn't force me to, to kill that podcast, I felt that in my best interest, since he approved raises and you know made my day-to-day -day life either uh, enjoyable or not so enjoyable, uh, I, I decided to kill the show. So uh, I killed that show and I needed a new direction and I wanted to do something super, super clean. So I launched my other podcast, which you're familiar with readily yep. random was the name of the really? show. Yep. And it actually started as a recovery type podcast, meaning I would have others that had been through addiction or been through other challenges in their lives and had right. recovered from those addictions or challenges and had moved on to a more fruitful life but it wasn't working for me. I don't know, you know, we're only a few years post recovery for myself and it just wasn't really resonating with me. So it slowly evolved into just being something random. And then from there it evolved into more of an entrepreneur type podcast. And uh, it's been happening. I've had that now for about three and a half, four years. Yeah. And uh, it just recently, I haven't even honestly publicly announced the change in the name to you're the boss. It, it is you're the boss right now. If you go follow me on, on iTunes or Spotify or anywhere, the show is you're the boss, but I haven't made a public announcement as of yet. So. Uh, okay. Well, you're the boss is now the podcast to listen to. It is. It most definitely right. is. So jump in there, subscribe to you're the boss. And uh, yeah. I'd love to talk to you every week. So, I mean, that's, that's essentially it in a nutshell, how it all came about. Uh, you know, there's definitely some twists and turns in there as well, but I tried to give you the revised version. <laughs> well, I love that. And thank you just for taking us through the journey because there are so many moments in there where, you know, the fear of doing something new is something that we all deal with all the time. And like I talked about in the opening passage of my book, you know, it, 
this, this fear that we sometimes need to overcome when we're doing something new and there's going to be change afoot. And we've gone through that. Goodness knows we've all gone through that in the last year and a half with all that we've been through with the epidemic, with the pandemic. It's, you know, it's how we choose to deal with it. It's how we choose to look at who we are as individuals and how we want to move forward in life. And it's easier said than done, but our ability to sometimes reframe something or have the courage to lean into it and really appreciate that this journey of life is something that it's really sometimes not as much about that destination as it is the journey. And the journey can be an adventure and it is different and it may not be what we expected, but how do we navigate through those moments where the world's not handing us what they we thought we were getting and we've got to recreate. And, you know, you went through some pretty tough times and some pretty interesting moments where you were at a crossroads, right? Most definitely. Most definitely. So how did you, how did you kind of dig into those moments of that fear and, you know, not knowing how you might end up where you might end up if you went one way versus another? You know, some of those were, uh, they were just rolls of the dice, to be honest with you. I mean, I was scared to death. Uh, one of the things that always drove me as, as a little guy, I, I lived a fairly interesting yin yang type life. I went to a private school my whole life, right. but I grew up in a trailer park. So there was an interesting balance there. The dichotomy, well. right? Yeah, it's crazy because my grandmother paid for everything from, from a school perspective. And that leads back to, you know, I was born with a birth defect where my, my sternum was inverted. So instead of growing out, it was growing in. So my chest was sunk in. And by the time I'd reached four years old, my organs, my lungs and everything had grown outward. My chest had grown inward and I'd gotten to the point where I was going to essentially suffocate. Uh, so I had to have reconstructive surgery in order to even survive. So I, at, at four and a half years old, uh, I had that surgery. So they had to protect me growing up, which that's kind of ironic because I ended up wanting to be a fighter, right? Well, oh. that's because of the protection. I spent so much time being coddled and hidden away in my little private school. And truth, uh, truth be told, I did venture out my sophomore year of high school. Uh, I thought, you know what, I'm I'm getting out there. I'm going to go to a real school. And I tried right. to go to Sherman High and uh, proceeded to take a pretty good whooping and then ran oh, back no. to my little private school. So, so, <laughs> so it didn't work out because I didn't have the social skills to interact on that level. I didn't know how to make that transition. And yeah, that was scary too. You know, going from someplace that I knew everybody from, from fourth grade since I started going to the school because it was K through 12. And I started at this particular school, I think it was fourth grade. And I've been there six years, and we'd all grown up together. And I venture out and go over to this world where I don't really know how to act. And I learned real, real fast how not to act. Right. <laughs> but then I went back to where it was safe. So all of these challenges, I mean, there were different times in my life that I was faced with these types of challenges. And that's why I wanted to be a fighter, because I hated the, the softness and growing up and being babied and being pushed around and being made fun of. And I just yeah. knew you know, Karate Kid came out in 84, I think it oh, was. That was incredible it. inspiration. If I learn the crane kick, I'm going to be in good shape, oh, yeah. right? So, <laughs> so I love so that. That was where all that came from. And everything up until my late 20s and early 30s was all, it, it was all balanced with martial arts and, and how I can find that strength there to move through other challenges that I came up with in life. Yeah. And that got me through everything until I had that realization and I, I still remember the day that it happened. And, and regrettably, the coach that uh, that had this impact on my life, he just recently passed away from COVID. Uh, it's been about a month now. And so uh, I was training for a big fight. And I had gone down to Houston to where his gym is. And I was training with some of the world champions. I mean, if you've ever watched any UFC, I'm sure some of your listeners yeah. have seen some Ultimate Fighting yeah. Championship. This coach coached world champions from back in the 90s. And this was at that time. And he walked by me as I was wrestling with a UFC fighter. And he looked at me and he goes, your cardio's a bit suspect, bro. And I was, here, look, I'm, I'm, uh, that sounds so cheesy and it sounds so lame. But for me, it was such a, a, an awakening because that's what I got left with with my surgery. Right. I only have about 60% lung capacity of the average person, much right. less the athlete. So I'm trying to compete with these world-class athletes with 60% lung capacity. And when Saul walked by and he made that just a little quip, your cardio is a bit suspect, bro. 
it triggered something in me that it was that realization that you're not, because I was in the best shape of my life. I trained right. backside off for this fight and it wasn't going to happen. And right. that just sent me spiraling. It sent me completely out of control. I yeah. was completely lost. I had nothing. My whole life had been built around this, this fantasy, this dream. And now the realization that it's gone, just it, 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 right. left it me. pulled, it pulled everything out from yeah. under and I can't totally. imagine. And, you know, to be in that place, you know, yeah, it's, it was extremely difficult. And that's kind of what led to the partying and the drinking. And it just escalated over the years because that's all yeah. I had at that time. Oh, I'm right. going to go have a good time. This isn't going to work out for me. So let's party. Right. And so it, that, that's where I ended up. Well, look, it it's not, you know, life, amazing life lessons and opportunities come from those moments, those hardships. And, you know, I think we've seen a really unusual year where so many people have had their lives, their businesses, the world as they know it pulled out from under them. And so I think we're dealing with, you know, society in a very different way. And I think there's incredible support that's going on. There seems to be a real connection because of a shared experience that we as humanity have gone through that I feel has created an amazing shift. Um, we're connected in different ways to one another. We've created a sense of community with each other in a lot of different ways. And, you know, I, I hope to God that where you're at now and the journey you're on, because what you're doing now is you are empowering other people. I mean, you've trained people, you've done this incredible work over the years, but now, I mean, look at what you've given to me. You have given me this voice, this community, this platform. You've shown me how to take my message and deliver it in ways that I never knew that I could do. And, you know, I really want to kind of talk about that for a bit, because I know that a lot of people listening and tuning into this episode are so curious and there's many people out there, you know, we do a series around, you know, you, do you have a book in you? And a lot of people say, I want to be an author. I want to write a book. They haven't ever figured out what that means. Um, they just think it sounds really cool and it is, and it's interesting. And it kind of gives you another title next to your name and people go, wow, that's incredible. But the work that it takes to write, the work that it takes to publish, the work that it takes to market your book is no easy feat. It is a massive undertaking. And similarly with a podcast, I mean, you've got to know what equipment to use and what to plug into where and how to create the intros and the outros and how to get them uploaded. So let's kind of take a step into that world. Yeah. And this is really, you know, you are so in the epicenter of it on so many levels. We were blessed to meet through the On Air Brands group and the PodMax team. And On Air Brands is actually producing it, but they brought you in as my guy and said, Larry's going to help pave the way for you and help you figure this out. And I dare not say how many hours we spent figuring out how to plug one thing into another remotely because. I just couldn't figure that out, but you so patiently took me through the process. Um, many people want to have a podcast. Why should they? Why shouldn't they? It's not for everybody. So let's talk about that for a moment. Yeah, it's interesting because it's it's really not for everybody. And uh, although we saw a massive increase in the number of podcasts during the pandemic, uh, we are starting to see a shift again down and the numbers are starting to shrink once again, because a lot of folks feel that a podcast is just grab a mic and start talking or even even more so grab your phone and start. Exactly. Recording. Right. Uh, and it goes so far beyond that. Sure. It can be a, a verbal diary of sorts. Uh, it could be a journal. It could be something along those lines. But if you have your goal in mind of reaching an audience and delivering a message, it's got to go well beyond that. It's got to be something so much more than just recording into your phone. Uh, and, and I think we're seeing that shift right now, especially with the influx of corporate media. I mean, everywhere you look, every media outlet has a podcast. And guess what? It's professionally produced. It's professionally edited. It's professionally audio engineered. It's an experience. It is something that people look forward to listening to. And the days of grabbing your phone and recording an episode and just calling it a podcast and going, oh, I'm not worried about audio quality. Those days are gone. Yeah. 
we, we really do need to, to focus and, and, and determine what are our goals for a podcast? What are we trying to do with this podcast? And how can we provide the greatest listening experience for the end user or our listeners? And that's the biggest shift that I've seen as of late. So are people more inclined to do podcasts where they are just speaking themselves and kind of talking people through a journey, a story, a diary, a life, advice, masterclasses, or are we seeing more people in interview situations where they're bringing in experts and authorities and other people? Because I think there's so many different versions of a podcast that people can actually create. Um, originally when I was starting years ago, when I had all this incredible content around the reinvention subject and topic, and I'd been interviewing a lot of people and was preparing and writing my book, um, I was getting ready to launch a podcast and I actually did a couple of episodes on another medium, um, just to kind of play with it, but it was just kind of more of me kind of doing like my verbal blog, if you will. And it didn't really dawn on me that maybe I should interview of a handful of people and have them, you know, on my show until later when I realized the richness of what I had in these conversations. And I was invited to be a guest um, on the first podcast that I did with Mitch Slater, mm -hmm. who actually had me on, who you know. And I was in New York. It was before the epidemic. It was October before the March of the release of my book. So it was the first one talking about my book. And I actually brought in studio with me one of the gentlemen that was interviewed in my book, Brad Jakeman, to be my guest. So Larry um, Mitch was interviewing me. And I was in turn saying, well, let's talk about Brad's story. And it was an incredible scenario. And I just thought, my God, this is what I want to be doing more of. And so it was a very aha moment for me in the podcast opportunity and possibility. And I like that richness of multiple voices. But is that a harder thing for someone to do? I mean, not everybody knows how to interview someone. <clears throat> I think people, I don't think, there's definitely more people that do the interview style podcast than getting on and having a monologue. Uh, yeah. Monologue podcasts are extremely difficult. They are so hard to do. And I remember the first time I ever started doing them myself, I undertook a, a, a an event that actually just wrapped up. Uh, it's called NAPOD POMO or National Podcast Posting Month, where you commit to this organization that you'll podcast every day for the month of November. Happens every year. And I took this opportunity to do a solo cast, not only a solo cast, but also to start to develop a relationship with the camera. I decided that I'd go live on Facebook every day as well. And I got to tell you, it was a totally different experience than just getting on a microphone and having a conversation with someone. Now, to your point, having a conversation and interviewing two totally different mediums. And the balance between the two is what I think makes a terrific podcast is where we can have a conversation, but at the same time, we're drilling into some of the subject matter. We're drilling into some of the, the, the topics that we want to cover with this particular guest. So the guest type podcasts are definitely the most popular podcasts that people are starting because I think they're easier to do, but the, the, the talent comes in and the experience comes in when you're doing it. And I don't mean to offend anyone, but you're doing it well. Right. Because there's definitely a difference there. So what does it take? I mean, here I am working at home at the moment. I cannot go into a studio. Well, I probably could at this point, but I haven't. And I didn't. And I did not start that way. And I was fortunate, again, to have you and the On Air Brands team give me the direction, provide me with the right equipment that I would need let's talk about like, what does it take to your point? You said, you know, some people can just do it on their phone. Sure. Like, what does it take these days? I mean, you know, we're all wired and easy, you know, we're all very tech savvy for the most part in the world these days. What does well, it really I, take? I, I think a lot of it takes a plan for starters. You, you have to understand why you're starting this podcast. Great what point. Your goals. Why? And, and, and Big why. Yep. that's the why is the biggest. Then from that why, you have to ask how. How can I exercise this why in a way that people will want to consume it? 
So if you, uh, for instance, you have, we, we were talking about the gardener earlier, the, the, the man, landscaping individual. If you're a landscaper and you're wanting to connect with your audience, you're wanting to connect maybe with your clients. I specialize these days in branded podcasts for companies. So people are wanting their brand to be more recognizable, get more recognition for their brand, get people to further understand their brand. So if your goal is to connect with your clients on a deeper level, you're going to create a listing experience. So a landscaper that has maybe a landscaping podcast, it'd be great for them to go ahead and pick up their phone, download a recording app that does, has some built in audio processing and record maybe while they're in a yard, maybe they're pruning some trees and maybe you can hear some birds chirping in the background and maybe way off in the distance, maybe you even hear a lawnmower going. Because what that does, they're speaking to that audience and they're solidifying their brand as being a landscape expert. So that creates a listening experience and it really draws that listener in. Now, if you're doing like an audio drama, audio drama is a totally different scenario because now we have to have actors. We have to have people that can actually become a part. Then you have audio engineering and you have sound design and you've got all these different elements that come into play. So depending on your goal is going to facilitate really what you need. But at the very basic level, you need a microphone, you need a recording device, and you need a podcast host. You need somebody to hold your media for you and distribute it out to all of the podcast players like iTunes and Spotify. Those are what you need. Those components, they're the most critical, but it gets the, the refinement comes into play once we have that established. You know, I remember when I started and I thought, okay, this is going to be really easy. I'm going to hit play and I'm going to record and I'm going to speak or interview or do my thing. And all of that was fine. But the reality is the editing, the noise, the, oh my goodness moments, the guests that say things that they're like, oh, I didn't mean to say that. Can you edit that out? I mean, you do need someone to help support some of that. I mean, some, some can probably wing it and, and be a little more just kind of organic and what they're doing to your point, but there is really, um, you know, parameters around how to create something professional. And I think, especially if we're looking to monetize our business, if we're looking to build an audience and really have some gravitas in this space, it is important that we surround ourselves with a team that can help us do that, that can help us do the show notes in a way that are compelling, that in our case, we have, you know, an audiogram that when we're promoting the episode, we have a great social media tile and we have an audiogram and it just sort of gives people a bit of a teaser. So all of those tools to market it, I mean, that's the whole other issue that we then get into. And, you know, getting the word out in what is, as we know, a very cluttered market. Are there any secrets to, you know, what to do, where to find your audience, how to kind of get, lure them in, make them want to listen? What do you think some of, some of those little tricks are? Well, I think the biggest trick is identifying your listener. Mm -hmm. Anytime we start a podcast and we really don't even know who we're talking to, you know, if you, you take, for instance, my show, Readily Random, I was very ignorant at the time when I when I named it that because what does that tell a listener? It tells them absolutely nothing. It tells them nothing. So my, my progression through the podcasting industry was extremely difficult because I made it difficult on myself. So one of the key factors to simplify everything is to identify your listener right out of the gate. This goes back to the plan that I was talking about when we determine our why, now we need to determine to determine our who. And for my clients that I work with, I have a series of questions that we go through. There's actually about 80 of them, if we wanna get that detailed, to yeah. really drill down and identify exactly who we're looking for to listen to our podcast. Once we have that, and I'm not a big fan of this word, avatar, once we have that avatar, or we've identified our ideal listener, that allows us to customize a marketing plan for our show. You know, if you have a business show, you're probably going to lean more towards LinkedIn for most of your marketing efforts. Uh, if you're reaching, trying to reach a younger generation, maybe somebody that's a little cooler than Olair, maybe you want to lean on TikTok or maybe you want to lean on Instagram Reels right now. Reels are terrific, even for businesses right now, because they're optimized on the platform. You get a ton of attention with an Instagram Reel that blows my mind. And you've got 
data behind it. You got all the analytics that will allow you to tweak and change your, your approach. There's so many different ways to do it, but the first step is figuring out who we're doing it for. Yeah, no, that's such a great point. I mean, that's, you know, in the case of any marketing, knowing who we're trying to target and reach them and, and connect with them, I mean, authentically connect with them. Um, what have been the funnest moments or interviews that you've been able to do, you know, where you were like, oh, you know, this is why I do what I do. I mean, I know my interview with you was fabulous, but <laughs> beyond that, I, um, tell you, I had this one lady, uh, Kathy Sharp Ross was, her, oh, oh, and she was um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, it was great. No, seriously. Thank but you. probably the pinnacle was, uh, I got to interview a member. Uh, and although he was a side member of Pink Floyd, growing up, Pink Floyd was one of my favorite bands. And Scott Page played in uh -huh. some of the 90s Floyd. He was on uh, like Momentary Lapse of Reason in some of those albums. Yeah. And uh, I was introduced to Scott Page and had the opportunity to have him on my podcast. And that was probably one of the pinnacles for me was just wow. talking to an actual member of Pink Floyd. No That's way. That's amazing. Awesome. So that was probably. I love that. Cool. I actually just went to the Pink Floyd exhibit here in Hollywood um, about three weeks ago. And it was this incredible, immersive retrospect on the entire band, each of the artists, um, the history of each album, very visual, very, you know, just amazing. So I, I can totally appreciate that. That is the coolest. And what have been some, some of your most uh, challenging moments in a podcast scenario where you've had a guest that just like is just not a good interview. You don't need to name names, but what do you do? How do you carry that? That's got to happen. I think to everybody where you're like, I want to have this guest on. And I always used to know because I used to do PR for authors and there are great writers in this world, but it doesn't mean that they can actually have a conversation. And I was in charge of doing a lot of their PR. And at the time it was like, oh my goodness, how are we going to get this brilliant author to put a soundbite together in an interview? And so, you know, I would imagine there are a number of interesting people that you've wanted to have or have had on your shows. And you're like, oh, this just is not going as well as I had hoped it had. How yeah, do you deal with that? You struggle is what you do. You struggle <laughs> and you tap into that professionalism and you do everything you can to ask those open-ended engaging questions that require more than a yes or a no answer. That's really the, the, the only thing you can do, but probably the, the one interview that stands out as one of the worst, I had a gentleman, he was a stand-up comic and I was pretty excited to talk to him, but he was playing like PlayStation the whole time we were on the interview and he wouldn't stop playing. So I can hear the buttons being mashed and hear uh, uh, and getting mad because he's oh dying. Or and I'm asking these questions and I just sit there and he's like, uh, you know, he makes some video game noises and then they're like, oh yeah, but uh, yeah, well, yeah, what'd you say? It was, oh no, it was the worst. It was the absolute, I didn't publish the episode. Yeah. So it's one of those where you realize that this is going nowhere. Yeah. And so in a very professional manner, I asked a couple of more open-ended questions and then I just wrapped it up and we just forgot we ever had that conversation. That's so. pretty funny. Well, that's true. I mean, that is the beauty of it, that you can do that and choose not to publish it. Um, I've got a fun question for you and then I want to open it up to some Q&A and we'll, we'll sort of sign off on the podcast piece of this, um, but keep keep my audience on here for some Q&A. Um, if you were to have a dinner party and you could have anybody at your table to break bread and enjoy an amazing meal and the people, whether they're dead or alive, are there anybody in your world that you would just love to have a conversation with and perhaps invite them onto your podcast? <laughs> oh man, it would, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt to be Robin Williams. Oh, yeah. Love Robin, that. Robin Williams. Yeah. yeah. He, he had such a tremendous even though I never met him, you know, uh, I, and, and I don't normally get attached to celebrities per se, yeah. uh, but Robin Williams impacted me from as far back as I can remember. I mean, even as a kid, I can remember yeah. Mork and Mindy and him on happy days yeah. uh, as Mork making his appearance there and yeah. all the way through all of his, I mean, I mean, uh, um, dead poet society, tremendous impact on me there in high school. Uh, I just, his whole body of work was amazing. And I mean, live at the Met, when, the, the concert that he did back in the, uh, back in the eighties is just such a classic comedy set. 
uh, he, he just impacted me in so many deep ways that love I that. would love to have that opportunity to, to, to pick his brain. A yeah. little bit. I remember seeing him concert in concert at the universal amphitheater here in LA yeah. many, many moons ago. And yeah, he was pretty special. I love that. He did a bit back in the seventies. Uh, it was, uh, it was on a smaller stage and it, mm-hmm. he talked about, uh, you only get one spark of madness. Mm. Don't ever lose that. And I still have that, that YouTube, you can find it on YouTube, just Robin Williams spark of madness. And it's about a five minute clip. And I have that saved on my YouTube channel and I still reference it from time to time, go back to just to charge up that spark of madness that I, that I shared with him, even though he didn't know we were sharing it. (laughs) Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Before we sign off any advice that you would like to leave our audience with in whether it has to do with life, whether it has to do with podcasting um, what is it that like you really just feel that you stand for and would love to inspire others with in what you do and who you are? The thing that I like to tell everybody these days is to tell your story. I think you're obligated to tell your story. Uh, There's so many people that are looking for answers that may share a similar path with you uh, or may be able to relate to the path that you've been on. And Mm -hmm. telling your story is something that I feel that we we have to do for for the younger generations. Uh, It's it's something that I do these days, it was very difficult. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest, it was very difficult for me to start sharing my story. Uh, I used to hide behind the microphone, I would be back here. And I I wouldn't let anybody really see Larry, I would let everybody see the guests, and I would hide behind the guests. But once I started telling my story, I saw the impact that I started to have. Exactly. And it was much deeper, much more heartfelt, and my growth as a person, my growth as a podcaster, and just my growth overall as a human being was exponentially accelerated once I started sharing my story. And I recommend you do the same thing. I love that. Thank you for saying that. I think it's one of the most extraordinary things. And, you know, in, in my book, I tell stories so many people's stories for exactly that reason. I want people to realize that if you can do it, they can do it. And I think there's something so powerful. I'm so appreciative of you sharing your story and your wisdom and your insights. And I encourage anybody who wants to tap in a little bit further to the magic of Larry Roberts that you Check out his profile on LinkedIn, connect with him. Definitely go to podcastboost.com. If you're looking to launch your own podcast, I am happy to connect you or just reach out to him directly. Larry, thank you so much for being a part of the power of reinvention and a part of my journey and my story. And I just adore you. And we will continue to talk as we always do. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kathy. It's been a pleasure. And we are going to continue without the podcast now. So if anybody wants to raise their hand, ask a question, make a comment, share anything, I would love you to do that. I did see some chat going on, but I couldn't read it because those aren't my real glasses. Now I can see it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's, that's a lot of our shamelessly promoting you in there that I can see. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Josh, hey, was, hi, how you doing, Josh? I'm all right, Kathy. What's good, Larry? How you doing today? Happy up, Thanksgiving. Man? Yeah, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. You too. Um, no, um, it was just, it was just real dope, Larry, you know what I'm saying? It's an amazing story. You know, going through all of that craziness, but I guess that's life. Um, I don't know. One thing I was I was I was going to say was probably because of that marketing. You know, marketing will make a big difference in your business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot a lot of power in that. Thank you, Josh. Well, I think we got a we got a silent group today. Ronnie, I'm glad to see you here, though. I I see you hiding behind your name on the screen, and I'm really glad you're here. So thank you for being around and seeing you in a few weeks. Um, Larry, this was such an awesome conversation. I just, I love what you were able to share. And 
you know. I didn't know we were going there. I, I didn't, and uh, I apologize if I went the wrong way. No, you did not go the wrong way. And there is no wrong way. First of all, there is the way and you sharing your story, I think is just so awesome. It's so um, inspiring for others to sort of get a feeling of who you are and look, we're all made up of our history of who we are. And it brings us to where we are today. And, you know, so often when I ask my guests, what is your story? Where did you come from? What did you dream of when you were little? Did you imagine you'd be doing what you were doing today? You know, I've got a chapter in the book. Hello, are you still in there? Sometimes we need to reach back and remind ourselves of what was important for us, what we're passionate about. We lose sight of it. We get caught up in the big wide world of nine to five or responsibilities, and we forget how to listen to ourselves. And, you know, we grow into who we are in different ways. And, you know, that makes you who you are and where you are today. So I love that. I love the, you know, it's not just like, here's Larry and he's going to tell you how to do a podcast. <laughs> There's so much more to who is Larry and why do I adore you so much? And why do we have this connection that we've had from the very first conversation? And, you know, anybody who's willing to spend seven hours on the phone with me on a Saturday, <laughs> I will forever love, right? Most so, definitely. Most definitely. I know. So I'm just so grateful. So thank you for today. Thank you for this conversation, for being a part of this. We're going to have this posted on the website. We're going to have the podcast launched this coming week, um, next week, sorry, not this week, next week. And um, everybody will get to listen and tune in and share in it. So oh, I'm really grateful. Kathy. Yes, Josh. Where where does Larry DJ nowadays? Oh, I don't, I don't DJ. I He's not DJ. So you 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 how how often you run your podcast? Every uh, week, week or every week it drops on Tuesdays. Every Tuesday, okay. Josh. It's called the Boss. You're, you're the, the boss. boss. Sorry, you're the boss. And it's on no, iTunes. You're the boss. Ah, uh, you're the boss. Uh, you're the boss. <laughs> you, know, you're the boss. you know what I love uh, about that name is like someone hears that and they're like, I am? I, oh, yeah, I am the boss. Yeah. I like that. It's yeah, very my wife loves it too. Whenever I go, you're the boss, she's like, you damn right. Yes, I am, dear. <laughs> Don't forget it. So, yeah, Josh, it's on all of the fabulous iTunes, Spotify, Google. You can find it everywhere. You're the you boss. Out there. Yeah. And you know what? Like I could just listen to Larry's voice forever. It doesn't really matter what you're talking about. It's like that voice is just fabulous. So I yeah, am just so grateful. It's, it's I want to say thank you all for being here today. Thank you very much for being a part of the community, being here every week. Um, next week, we will not be doing a show. We'll have that on social and in our newsletters, but I will be traveling next week. So um just uh, come back the week after because we've got some amazing guests coming up over the coming weeks. And where are uh, you going? I'm actually going to be on the East Coast. I have to go to. Ah! Yeah, I'm just. I've got a quick trip, but I won't be able to do the show oh. because I'll be in meetings. So, one of these days when you're on the East Coast, we yes, should, I'm a New York City girl. I know, yeah, yeah. I know. So and, when um, I've got a longer trip, we'll have to meet up and have a coffee. I'd love to meet you in person, Sally. Oh, I would love that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so, I, I'll mute myself out of, <laughs> okay. out of courtesy to all of you. Well, thank you. <laughs> all good. So have a great day, everybody. Have a beautiful week. Happy Thanksgiving as we ease into the holiday season. Happy Hanukkah for those celebrating it. And we'll talk soon. Oh, I can't happy. stop. Hanukkah. Oh, Hanukkah. Okay. Sally, I'm going to mute you in a second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chad. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Much. Happy reinventing. Enjoy. Larry, love you. Thank, Thank you so much. I appreciate Have it. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.